thank you very much. And allow me to say at the outset what a tremendous honor it is to be a part of this seminal symposium and to express my gratitude to Judge Robinson for this invitation to join you in, in conversation. Many years ago, too many years to recall, I chose to submit as a PhD proposal the issues surrounding the economics of the rise of chattel slavery. I was 21 years old at the time and didn't know what I was getting into in terms of the broader implications of this. But I understood then even as a teenager from reading the literature that there were several competing options available to Western colonial adventurers entering the new world. And those options that were clearly available uh, had relative merits. The Western European complex expanding across the Atlantic into the Americas uh, in search of labor in order to carry out major projects in agriculture and in mining uh, and in other forms of economic development extraction, these options of labor would have included the transportation of the European working class across the Atlantic in the form of indenture contracts, contracts of indentured labor, or they could seek to mobilize by various forms of coercion, the use of indigenous native American labor and also available to them was access to West Africa in order to extract oppress coerced labor into production. My task as a graduate, as a doctorate student was to account for the ultimate choice after a hundred years of experimentation by various European countries, initially Spain, then uh, the Portuguese and Brazil. So the Spanish uh, in the Caribbean and Mexico, parts of Latin America, then the Portuguese uh, in Brazil, followed by the English, Dutch, French, and Danish, and the Nordic nations and other European countries uh, subsequently. But they were all mixed and commingling different forms of labor. Within an ideological pedagogy that was at once consistent with their own national systems of labor and innovating and initiating new systems of legal labor relations within their colonies that were departures from systems of labor which were indigenous to their own European context. The issue around the genocide that followed the use of indigenous American labor is well known. 
the, the Spanish and the Portuguese developed various forms of contract systems because they felt that given their own labor history uh, in Spain and Portugal, that chattel slavery would have been resisted domestically by the Catholic Church, by prominent individuals in civil society. And there was indeed this ambivalent, to some extent reticent, about whether the indigenous dominated, oppressed, conquered populations of the Americas could be driven to chattel slavery. And in the end, it was the established norm that this should not be the case. Of course, there were always individuals who pushed beyond that prescription and did participate in developing a property chattel relationship to the indigenous people, but by and large, uh, this was not initially the norm. When the Protestant nations entered the New World, the Caribbean especially, the English, the Dutch, the French, the Danish primarily, they too began with an experiment around the use of their own domestic labor from Europe transported across the Atlantic in the forms of indentured servitude. My own PhD dissertation dealt with the extensive use of white indentured labor from Britain in the Caribbean in the formative years of colonization. So that would be Barbados, Jamaica, the Leeward Islands, Virginia, the Carolinas, Pennsylvania, New York. And I explored back then the economics of that choice, that it was cheaper and more productive and sustainable to import working class labor to initiate production on the plantations. And as a result of that, hundreds of thousands of workers from Britain were transported to work on the sugar plantations on the contracts of indenture. And a typical contract of indenture was that you would, the, the investor in your labor would pay for your transportation across the Atlantic, provide housing for you on the plantation, but you were under contract to work for between seven to 10 years of, of labor on that plantation. And at the end of your contract of indenture, you were given a small sum of money to launch you into your freedom or a piece of land to launch you as an independent person. That was a model that was chosen to lay the foundation because the Protestant nations were not yet, and that included the French, but they were Catholic also, did not possess the economic resources in order to make a massive investment in the African transatlantic slave trade. But within two generations of this model, it became perfectly clear that it was not sustainable, that neither the indigenous people of the Caribbean, the native people, that that was sustainable for the big project of colonization, neither could working class labor, whether they were voluntary indentures, whether they were exported and deported convict laborers, whether they were the working class poor who were considered dependent upon the state and therefore subject to roundup and deportation. And that was how you got a trade in white labor, convicts, political prisoners, working class poor, the dependent upon the state working class poor, local cities, 
were given authority to round them up and ship them out to work on the plantation. But that system proved to be unsustainable given the enormity of this project, which was going to be the rise of plantation America, whether in the form of sugar production in the Caribbean, cotton production in the US South, or rice or other agricultural products. The magnitude of what was conceptualized, the enormity of the project of plantation expansion as the basis of sustaining and growing wealth in Europe, that the enormity of this project required a massive pool of labor that was sustainable over hundreds of years. And that is when the gaze, that is when the gaze of Western Europe, looking at the future of the enterprise of colonization and the notion that this colonization must generate an economic return of great magnitude in order to be worth it. In other words, Europe was not going to undertake this project unless this project was going to be profitable, unless the profitability was going to be sustainable, and whether the sustained profits were going to lead to enormous increase in wealth, economic growth, and economic development in Europe itself. So the macroeconomics of this was determined and it was agreed upon. And that the only way this was going to work was to have access to another pool of labor from Africa outside of their own traditions of labor that could be justified and enabled to be sustainable. This was an enormous, significant decision. And it took place first in the Caribbean in a highly organized way. It had emerged in Brazil, but in Brazil, it had spread across the Northeast part of that colony, but where it reached its full maturation as an economic model and system was in the Caribbean and in the Caribbean, it was Barbados because Barbados was the center of the British empire in the Americas in the early part of the 17th century. Barbados was colonized, an empty island, a place where England could begin with no indigenous resistance, an open island, and they could begin the new enterprise. And Barbados is where they started. The first act in 1636, just 10 years after colonization, the Barbados Assembly passed a proclamation that said for the first time anywhere in the Americas, from today and henceforth, any person of Africa or African descent who arrives in this colony shall be deemed a slave forever and their ownership defined as the ownership of property. And that property right shall be passed on from generation to generation. And there shall be no constraints or restraints in respect of the use of that person who is now defined as property. That was seismic because the English in Barbados were making these massive investments in sugar plantations and the technology of plantation production, the sugar mill with all of the sophisticated engineering of the time large tracts of land rolled out into sugar estates. And the investor was making this huge investment in land and technology and labor. The average plantation, let's say it was 500 acres, required at least 300 enslaved Africans to make it work efficiently. The average price of an enslaved African at that time was 30 to 40 pounds, male and female. So you're 
the value of your enslaved labor was more than the value of the land. And therefore investors, entrepreneurs wanted to be sure that their investment in labor, in African labor was that associated with property, real estate and chattel. And they demanded that from the government and the government gave it to them as the security for their entrepreneurial effort in massive capital investment and profitability. 20 years later, the Barbados legislature set this all out in an act for the good governance of Negroes. And in this act, which was innovative, it was the first of its kind, the Barbados, the English in Barbados, the English enslavers made it clear that they were framing a piece of legislation, not just for domestic management, but for the region and the world. And it began with the usual preamble. And whereas the Africans are seen as a barbarous, inhumane people, a brutish people, not fit to be governed under the laws of Christians, which sets them apart, but a special set of laws required for their governance, be it therefore ordained, blah, blah, blah. The preamble to the act made it clear that Africans were not human, at best subhuman, but the laws that were going to be used to govern them were precise because African peoples could not be governed under the same laws as Christians because Christians were deemed as white and therefore the Africans were subhuman and non-human and therefore required special forms of laws. Thus, the so-called slave laws were about the management of chattel. And thus, the Africans were defined as property with all of the normal rights of property that were expected. What were the property rights? You could buy it, you could sell, you could mortgage, you could use it as currency, you can use it as collateral, you can pass it on in wills, all of you, you can use it to pay taxes and you were taxed by owning it. All of these normal expressions of what is property and chattel were applied to the Africans. That is the meaning of chattelization. It could be bought, sold, mortgaged, bequeathed, all of those functions. And of course, you had no human identity. The Barbados model was then exported across the Caribbean by the British. And those laws were eventually taken to South Carolina. South Carolina becomes the American colony that first implements the Caribbean model. And this is why South Carolina became the first colony in English America with a black majority. And this is why South Carolina is seen as the heart of slavery in the US South. And this explains also why South Carolina is considered by some people to be one of the most racist states in the US South because of that legacy of being the first state to embrace chattel slavery, to implement chattel slavery, and to develop African enslaved people as the social majority uh, in the colony. Now, while this was being done, it was necessary therefore to, it was necessary therefore to remove other forms of competing labor. And to that end, a very important development took place in the British parliament. Two white indentured servants somehow were able to spirit a letter out of Barbados into England and was taken before the House of Commons under the Cromwellian rule. It was called a petition of two indentured servants, Mr. Floyd and Mr. Rivers, who are asking for justice against their white enslavement in the Caribbean. And the English House of Commons met to hear this petition. 
And they determined that what they had heard about white people being treated like, like slaves in Barbados and in the Caribbean was unacceptable. And Cromwell made a great speech. And which she said, you know, the history of the English people is the history of the gradual freeing of the lower orders. And if we are going to reverse our history by enslaving white people in the colonies, then that has to be stopped because it would make us men most miserable. And thus the parliamentary process of uprooting chattels, uh, uprooting any evidence of white slavery, put it aside that white people, white workers must never be treated like African workers. That system of white oppression must end and therefore they got permission to eradicate white indentured servitude from the Caribbean and have it replaced completely by African chattel slavery. So we have the evidence in the English parliament of a direct political instruction to eradicate white servitude and replace it with black chattel slavery as the model for the modern world. And to this end, they have succeeded. Chattel slavery then became the standard model of colonization that Africans could be bought and sold on the market. But I should say this also, at the time of the implementation of chattel slavery, its regionalization and its application across the Americas and the wider world, there were many organizations and many people in Europe who were fighting against this activity. There was a strong civil society movement that said the chattelization of the African people is morally wrong. It is sinful and unchristian. So there were movements within civil society that were pointing to the criminal nature of chattel slavery, that it was criminal, sinful, and moral. And it's interesting that when the Emancipation Act was being passed in Britain, that those same groups of people 200 years later were making the same argument that the time has come to stop chattel slavery because it is criminal, sinful, and moral and Christian. And the same arguments were used at the beginning and the same arguments were used at the end. So the question is, why were these arguments not effective at the beginning and why they were effective at the end? They were not effective at the beginning because the British state, the state haven't listened haven't listened to the competing arguments, took the decision that chattel slavery was in the national interest. And all of those persons and groups who opposed it were opposed to the national interest of England seeking to become the richest nation in Europe, raising its capital, raising its funds to build an army, to build a powerful state, so it could compete and threaten France and the Netherlands and other competing countries. And the only way England was going to transcend militarily above other European countries is if it had access to an, a form of wealth that would give it that capacity. And the only way they could get that wealth was chattel slavery and plantation development. And therefore it was in the national interest. And all of those voices were brushed aside. Even when Wilberforce, William Wilberforce sought to use those arguments, the King of England, King William threatened him. Mr. Wilberforce, be careful with what you are saying about slavery, be careful. This institution is needed to promote England as a globally competitive economic nation. Be careful what you are saying a veiled threat to anyone who stood up against it on grounds that it was criminal, sinful, immoral, unchristian. So we come to the end of this process where the Emancipation Act embraced all of those arguments. Yes, it was sinful, it was criminal, 
It was immoral, and therefore we have to end it and end it now, primarily because the nation no longer needed it. It had served its purpose. It has made England into the wealthiest country in Europe, if not in the world. England becomes the first industrial country because it had the finance coming from slavery to build the factories and the cities and the towns. The inflow of investments coming from the colonies and slavery, the process had reached a, a terminal moment. England had won, had emerged as the most powerful country in Europe. The enslaved people did act for reparations. When the act was being passed, they said, how about us? Our labor was stolen from us for centuries. We should receive compensation. We want reparations. The British government told them to be silent, to be silent, you have no voice, and that you should be grateful that we are freeing you. So whatever reparations you think you should have, you are getting it in the form of the freedom that we are giving you. The enslaved then responded, you take our labor by military conquest. You enslave us against our will. We fought against you to demonstrate that we have not accepted your imposition. Every generation of enslaved people revolted. The Caribbean became a military theater, rebellions, after rebellions, a black revolutionary movement against slavery, proof that there was no acceptance of it. We want reparations and they were told to be silent. The movement is now here again. And what I want to say to you by way of conclusion, that between the emancipation legislation of the 1830s and today, there were at least six or seven major spikes in the demand for reparations. So the enslaved demanded it. The first generation of free Africans demanded reparations. And from then until today, every generation has been asking for reparations. So reparations is, an, is one of the oldest political movements in the Caribbean that began during slavery, continued after emancipation, and is now back on the agenda big time once again, 200 years of the demand for this, all the way into the present moment. And finally, there have been two approaches to the demand for what is called reparations. There are those calculations that are based upon wealth extraction from enforced labor. Many calculations are based on this, on this notion. Let us say, for example, in the case of Britain, which is the case I know well, the British would enslave, let's say they have enslaved 6 million Africans, uh, both imported and those Creole who were born on their plantations. What if you take each adult and pay them the wage that you would have paid the lowest paid worker in Britain, how much back pay would you have to deal with? Let us say you're paying the workers back in England on the agricultural estates three pence a day. Make that calculation for the millions of Africans who you got free labor, free labor from 6 million people for 200 years. If you had to do a calculation, what would it come like? The figure was staggering when the calculation was done by a group of economists in the city of London. The figure they came up with was larger than the gross domestic income of England. It was larger than the gross national product of England. It was somewhere in the area of six, six trillion pounds or something like that. Just as an indicator, of how much value you had extracted from enslaving 6 million people against their will for 200 years without paying them a wage. Then you have other calculations that are said, well, we don't want to deal with it in those terms. What we are saying is that that period of enslavement of wealth extraction and colonization have left the people of the Caribbean who are the descendants of that process 
in the depths of poverty. And the poverty has translated into illiter mass illiteracy, extreme public ill health. And when you look at the black population today in the Caribbean, if you use the, the criterion or the marker of chronic diseases, hypertension, diabetes, if you take that marker of chronic diseases and apply it across the world, the black people in the Caribbean are the sickest people in the world because the descendants of the enslaved people in the Caribbean have the highest per capita expression of diabetes and hypertension. And this is why today the first two major slave societies, the first two major slave societies, Barbados and Jamaica, are now competing for the title amputation capital of the world because there is no place in the world with the kind of expression of diabetic, diabetic competition challenges resulting from diabetes. The amputation of limbs, complications from type two diabetes, complications from diabetes. Barbados and Jamaica have the highest percentage of amputations per capita in the world. Because the correlation between that medical fact and the fact that Barbados and Jamaica were the first two significant chattelization economies in the world. When these countries became independents in the 1960s, 70 to 80% of the people of African descent could not read or write. The Europeans walked away, Britain walked away, said you want independence, we'll have it. But they wanted independence because they wanted to get away from the brutalization, the brutalization of the colonial imperial exploiter. They wanted freedom from them. But in so grasping that freedom, were left abandoned with circumstances of public ill health, massive illiteracy, and quite frankly, an inability to pursue economic development in an orderly fashion. But they did it, they pursued it. And through their efforts, they were able to convert the, 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 the crudity of a colony the barbarity of a colony and convert it into a democratic nation. And they have done very well to build a democratic sensibility out of the crudity of a colony. They did it. But the question remains, what if they were paid reparations? Would Jamaica and Barbados and all of these other colonies not be further ahead in their economic growth poverty eradication, their modern culture and civilization, but they were left to struggle on their own, to struggle on their own, to build out the basic infrastructure for democracy from the crudity of a colony. They were left to do it alone. And this is why the reparations movement is also looking not so much at how much cash or how much is required to compensate labor, but what is required to promote the development of democratic society and economy today out of the rubble of an abandoned colony. That is also a part of it. And so colleagues then, the movement from this criminal chattel culture that became the basis of American colonization, the enrichment of the American nation when it finally emerged and Europe cascading today into black communities, whether in Alabama, whether in Mississippi, whether in Barbados and Jamaica, the Bahamas, wherever these black people were chattelized, those societies and communities have remained impoverished, racially oppressed, dominated by white minorities in the economy and the society. The legacy, the legacy of chattelization is palpable today all 
around us and every person of African descent who have been a part of the rise of democracy and civil rights and human rights have been fighting against the headwind of the legacy of slavery. And it is only a repertory justice movement that can bring an end to this. And I have said it once, and I will say it again, finally, here today, this reparations movement is gonna be the greatest political movement of the 21st century. It's gonna be the greatest political movement of the 21st century. And there's nothing that can stop it because it's embedded in the search for justice, equality, and democracy in the 21st century. And it took us, our ancestors, all of the 19th century to uproot chattel slavery. From the Haitians who first took that step, from the Haitians all the way through eventually to Brazil and Cuba, the Spanish and the Portuguese who started it, were the last to end it. So between Haiti and 1804 and Brazil and Cuba in the 1880s, that was a hundred years of effort to uproot chattel slavery. Then it took us all of the 20th century to convert those legal freedoms into social and political freedoms, the human rights, the civil rights. We lost, we lost all of our greatest advocates, Martin Luther King, Malcolm X, Mega Evers. You can go all the way through to Nelson Mandela. We lost our finest and brightest intellectual leaders of democracy. We lost them because of this 20th century struggle for human rights and civil rights. Every black community in the world paid a very dear price for civil rights and human rights. But here we are now at the 21st century. And we are saying the next stage is our repartory justice rights. And if it take us all of the 21st century to litigate it, generation after generation are going to fight for reparatory justice rights in all of the 21st century if we have to, and much the same way we fought all of the 20th century for the right to vote, for civil rights and human rights. This is endemic to our journey to justice. And it's not going to end until that justice is attained. I thank you.